If you have your Bible, you're going to open up into uh, the Gospel of Luke. It's a New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, third book in the New Testament. Um, and we're going to continue on our series um, called Eight Days That Changed the World. Now, if you're new, if you're new to, to FBC Allen, um, this is your first time here, or maybe this is your first time in a long time, we're, we're in the middle of our, of our series, our Easter series that's taking us uh, right up to Easter Sunday. And uh, what we're doing is we're following the, the days of what sometimes is called Holy Week. Uh, and so we're lo- we've looked at each day of the week. And so today for us is uh, Thursday. We're, we're on Thursday. And last week, as we, we, took a, we, we took a look at Wednesday, and it's sometimes Wednesday is, is called Silent Wednesday because there's, there's no record in Scripture of anything Jesus did on that day. Um, but we know Jesus didn't waste time, or he, he didn't waste a day. Um, <clears throat> and so based on his life and his ministry up to that point, it's, it's, it's safe to say that, that Jesus spent time praying and preparing for what was to happen on this day, Thursday, and then Friday. And if you were here last week, you, you had the opportunity to experience a, a real powerful time of prayer for different needs in our lives and in the lives of others. We didn't, we didn't do a lot of talking about prayer, but what we did is we did a lot of praying together. And, and one of the cool things that we're doing as a staff, as a ministerial staff, is, is we're praying for, for some of the, re- the requests that, that, we're, that we're given. Uh, we're praying one by one um, through, those, through those needs. And so it, I, if you missed it, um, I, I know we'll do it again sometime, but it, it, it was awesome. Um, and so, but so now Jesus faces, um, as he prepares, he, he's facing the road ahead that starts now on Thursday. And so I just want you to think back to, to Thursday, just a couple of, couple of days ago. What was your Thursday like? If you, um, if you were just kind of thinking about it, um, my Thursday got up like I normally do at noon. Um, then I took took a nap about 1.30 after lunch. No, I'm just kidding. But I was, I was thinking about Thursday. What was your Thursday? Well, um, what, here's what Jesus' Thursday on that week, on that Holy Week, here was Jesus' Thursday. Thursday is, is when he would make preparations to eat the Passover meal with his disciples, and they secured that upper room. Thursday is when Jesus actually teaches his disciples this, this object lesson, and he ministers to them by washing their feet. Thursday is when Judas um, betrays Jesus. He, he leaves the upper room where he's actually having this intimate moment with Jesus and this supper with him, and he leaves to go get the religious leaders who want to kill Jesus, who want to murder him, to lead them to Jesus. Thursday is when Jesus warned Peter that he would deny him three times, but Peter... <laughs> ironically, denied that he would deny Jesus. He told him he wouldn't do it. Thursday is when Jesus would, would with his disciples, make his trek from that room to the, to the Garden of Gethsemane. Thursday is when the disciples, who during all this time, when, when all this is ha- about to happen, Jesus is about to be crucified, they're, they're kind of really kind of una- a little bit unaware of the gravity of the situation, and so they have this argument amongst themselves about which one of them is the greatest. And Thursday is when Jesus gets to the garden and he's begging for his life. He's, he's on his knees. He's praying. The Bible records that he's actually in such, such deep sorrow and see, deep anguish that his, his, blood, his, his sweat is like drops of blood. And, and while he's doing this, his disciples are sleeping. Thursday is, is when Jesus is arrested in the garden where he's betrayed by a kiss from Judas. Thursday is when all his disciples scatter when he's arrested. Thursday was, was quite a day. And Thursday was also the day that, that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And, and I want to pick up in, in Luke chapter 22. We're going to be in chapter 22 and we're going to read uh, verses 14 through 20 this morning. Luke 22 verse 14. And it says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took a cup 
And after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So it's, it's Passover time in Jerusalem. We, we've shared this before, but during this week, the, the city is packed with people coming to participate in Passover. The Passover celebration uh, uh, for, the, for the Jewish people, it had deep significance because it, it commemorated the time that God spared, spared their ancestors from the plague of death and brought, brought them out of slavery in, in Egypt. The blood of the sacrificial lamb was, was spread on the doorpost, and God passed over all the homes where the blood was visible. This was the last plague that finally, uh, if you remember, it was, it was the death of all the firstborn, humans and animals. And Moses told the people, he warned, Moses warned Pharaoh this was coming, uh, and then he told the people, sacrifice a lamb, spread that lamb's blood over your doorpost, and, and what God will do is God will pass over you. The blood will be assigned to him to pass over you, to spare you. Uh, and, and then as, as we know from reading in Exodus, all the firstborn children, including Pharaoh's son, um, were killed that evening. So the lamb, uh, the, the lamb was sacrificed so that lives would be saved. And that is, what, that is what's being remembered and celebrated at Passover. And now Jesus, now remember Jesus was, he was called by John the Baptist. When John the Baptist first saw him, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that wasn't by accident. Because I, I, with John, as he's referring to the Lamb of God, I, he's referring to the Passover Lamb. Because Jesus is about to become the fulfillment of that. His blood will save the world from their sins, from an eternal death. The Passover lamb freed the people from slavery in Egypt, and the Lamb of God frees us from slavery to sin, to give us a new life, to give us new purpose, to hope, to secure our eternity with God. And so Jesus and his disciples, they're gathered together to share this meal. But this meal is different this time. It's more than just a remembrance of God's activity in the past. It's, it's more than just looking back to what, G, what God did for their ancestors. It's about what God is about to be up to, what he's up to now. If you notice in verse, in verse 15 there of Luke 22, Jesus said, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Other translations may say that he eagerly anticipated this. This is something that he's been looking for. And why is, this, why is this so different? Why is, why is this so anticipated? Well, Jesus knew at that moment what we have the amazing opportunity to understand now, that this meal would set the stage for what is about to, what is about to come. When they would eat the bread and drink the cup, they weren't just recalling a truth that their ancestors experienced. They were participating in a new covenant a new covenant for them and for the rest of the world and for us. Jesus' eagerness and his enthusiasm for this meal was because he knew what it would mean for, for the world. He knew what it would mean for the world then, and he knew what it would mean for the world now. And we see this in Hebrews 12 too, where he says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy that set before him? You see, Jesus saw something that his disciples couldn't see. Jesus saw something that, that we can't see. He knew what no one else knew. He knew the impact that the next couple of days would have on eternity. And he knew what, what was waiting for us in eternity should we follow him. This is on Jesus' mind as he reclines at the table with his disciples. Yes, he's, he's very aware about what's going to happen what's going to take place in the next 24 hours. He knows he's going to suffer. He knows he's going to be, be humiliated. He knows he's going to, to, to be in anguish and pain. He knows he's going to die, but he also knows that his death and his resurrection will accomplish something incredible. And so as they gather to eat the bread and drink the cup, he says in verse 19, do this, what? In remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And I want to focus on that word remembrance just for, just for a second. In, in getting ready for today, I, I read a great article uh, by Dustin Crow 
about what it means to remember during the Lord's Supper. And, and you, may have, you may have thought, okay, well, what, what does it mean? Doesn't it just mean recalling the past? Well, uh, does it mean that we shouldn't let things slip out of our mind? Okay, yes, I'll never forget what Jesus did on the cross. Another writer said, does it mean that we reminisce on the sufferings of Jesus so I feel really thankful or I feel really awful because of, of what he did? And for many Christians to remember, it's just kind of an ambiguous mental activity. But in the Bible, a call to remember is a vibrant, powerful, and don't miss this word, participa participatory, if I can say it, a participatory concept where we refocus our lives according to what's being remembered. I want to say that again. It's, it's a participatory concept where we refocus our lives according to what's being remembered. Another writer said, it's not merely a subjective recalling to mind, but an active manifestation of the continuing and actual significance of the death of Christ. You see, in, in our Western minds, in, in the way that we think, remembering to us just means recollecting or recalling to mind something that is no longer really a present reality. Nothing could be further from, from the Jewish concept. In the Jewish liturgy, re remembering means participating here and now in, in certain defining events in the past and also in the future. And so as a part of today, there is this remembrance, but, but let's focus on this new way of thinking, this new way of, of remembrance. And, and if, you're in your, if you have your outline here, this is what I want you to write down. This, in, when you're thinking about remembrance, here's what I want you to know about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is not reminiscing about a historical Jesus in the past, but it is the present participation in a living Christ that is with us right now. So it's not just about a historical Jesus, but it's a, it, it's a, a present participation in, in a living Christ that's with us now. And back to what we said earlier, we refocus our lives according to what's being remembered. You see, the historical event still matters today. Let me show you a, a picture up here. Oh, look at that. Wow. Cute couple, huh? Yeah. That was taken, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Half of it anyway, right? So uh, we call that Beauty and the Beast. But so, what, so that was taken 24 years ago, that j just March 11th. And I know what's going, to your, going through your head. What was she thinking? Um, she said yes, and then I didn't ask any other questions after that. So we were, we were good to go. Um, but so 24 years, and you can take that off because I know she doesn't want it to stay up there the whole time. So 24 years ago, uh, March 11th, we were at Pioneer Drive Baptist Church in Abilene, Texas, and we said vows to one another. We exchanged rings. I still have, well, actually, this is my second one because I lost my first one at a youth camp. Uh, I was playing baseball with some of the guys. And so, you know, when the ball goes over your head and you do stupid things like throw your glove, well, I threw my glove up, and along with my glove went my ring. And so it was quite funny, though. I appreciated our youth ministry at that point because literally there was about 30 kids who were on hands and knees side by side, and they just kind of walked the lawn, crawled the lawn looking for it. We couldn't find it. Um, so I came home after camp probably about— uh, I stayed away for about five weeks because I was really scared about what was going to happen. No, I'm just kidding. We got another one. But I got, we, got, uh, we have our rings, and we were married. And that was a moment in time. Our wedding day is—it's it's history. We have pictures to remember that day. Uh, we have a VHS tape that was recorded of that day. Yes, VHS. But, but here's, here's why I bring this up. It happened on March 11th, 1995, but the events of that day still have significance today. They still have significance today. When we celebrate our anniversary, it's not just about looking back on that day. And we do. We, we look back on that, and, we, and, and it's fun, and we remember a lot of things. But it's a celebration of the last 24 years, but it's also a celebration of what's happening now in our marriage. My life is impacted today because of the event that happened 24 years ago. My decisions today are impacted by that event. Where I go, what I do, what I say, my priorities, how we spend money, you know, the, the things that we do, it's all impacted by that event. You see, the Lord's Supper is just not remembering what Jesus did, but also what Jesus did and how that impacts our lives today. It's not just about an event, but it's about a continued transformation in our lives. 
John 6, 35 says, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. No one coming to me will ever be hungry again. Those believing in me will never thirst. You see, Jesus is the bread of life. He satisfies that deep spiritual hunger, that, that, that contentment that we are so longing for, that peace that we, we so all desire. That comes, from, that comes from God. God created us with eternity in mind. And so this hunger for eternity, this, this thing that we know that, that there's still more to this life, well, more to this life is God because it's not just about this life, but it's also about eternity. He alone uh, is, can save us. His body and his blood, uh, they were poured out for us. And it's a reminder that he satisfies that hunger and that thirst. And we, will never fe- we should never feel those again because of our relationship with Jesus. We're secure in him. And that's a truth that we need to remember today. And that's a truth that we need to remember every day. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. We are satisfied. Look at the person next to you and say, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, now that we know, now that we know that we have Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. This is through the message. I love the way it says this. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's talking about Jesus. He's been through weakness and testing. He's experienced it all, all but the sin part. We've experienced that. Jesus was perfect. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy. Accept his help. You see, in in the culture of the the priest and and the holy of holies, this idea, this passage, what this passage is telling us would have been unthinkable. You see, in the holy of holies, um, that's only where the high priest went. And the high priest only went there once a year. He was the only one allowed to go in there uh, to, to offer uh, sacrifice and to offer, uh, go before God on behalf of the people. And there was, a great, there was this great ritual and uh, so much cleansing that the priest had to do, so much preparation. It had to happen before he went into, he entered into the Holy of Holies. And he went in with a lot of great fear and trembling because he literally feared for his life to enter into this where the presence of God was. But the author of Hebrews reminds us that Jesus, our great high priest, made it possible to approach God the Father on our own. We don't have to go through a a priest. We, We are the priesthood a believer. And not only just approach the throne, but approach the throne of grace with confidence. It's like going to to one of your parents or or going to someone that you love that you know you can just kind of walk right up to. You don't have to ask for an audience or you don't have to say, hey, go in for me and tell them for me. We get to go. It's, it's like, it's like a, a little child running up to their, to their dad or their mom and just jumping up in their lap. That's, that's the access that we have to God now because of Jesus. And the Lord's Supper is a reminder that Jesus made that access possible. But it also means that that access is still possible today. Lamentations tells us that his mercies are new every day. Every day we can approach God Almighty to receive what we need to face this day. Psalm 23, 1 through 3, is a familiar passage to a lot of you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And I love the, the verb there. The Lord is, is my shepherd. That verb tense, is, is, it's, it's in the habitual present tense, which means that God is and always will be my shepherd. It's not a, it's not a past, it's not, a, it's not history, but it's present it's happening right now. He is my shepherd. That, that psalm can bring comfort to us today because it's true today. God is my shepherd. He is my savior. Jesus died for me, and that means I have life. That means I have forgiveness. I have mercy. I have grace. I have that all today because that truth is still true today. It's not what was, but it's what is. It's what is. Remembrance. Now, before we we go any further, I want to stop right here, and I want to celebrate what God did through Jesus on the cross. 
we remember not just the historical event, but the truth of that event for you and me today. Now, I'm going to ask our deacons if they would go ahead and, and get into place and, and move where they need to be, because we're going we're to start passing out the, the elements to the Lord's Supper. Um, and and there, as, you get, as, the, as these elements come past by, understand, remember that there's going to be two cups stacked together. So you'll have the, you'll have the wafer and you'll have the juice all, all together. Um, if you happen to have a, a gluten sensitivity, if, when they start passing, if you would just raise your hand and one of our other deacons will, will bring, will bring uh, the elements to you there. Um, and when you get yours, here, here's, what, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hold on to it. Don't take it just yet. I want you to hold on to it because we're all going to take it at the same time together. But as you wait, what I want you to do is I want you to begin to prepare your heart and minds for what we're about to do. Remember what, what the wafer, what, remember what the juice, what they symbolize. That, that's the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember the sacrifice that was made for you. And remember that what happened 2,000 years ago still has power, significance, and meaning today. Now, if, you're, if you're a follower of Christ, then, then you're, invited, you're invited to join us. Um, but remember to not, I, I don't want us to approach this time lightly. We need to spend some time in confession. Spend some time, as I said earlier, preparing our hearts, preparing to receive this gift that God has given us. The Bible says in Luke twenty two nineteen, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in Luke twenty two twenty, it says in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Father, we thank you for what you did. Amen. So when our pastor is, is here and he's leading us through, through the Lord's Supper, he likes to say when we take the, the juice, sort of a, sort of a toast. And uh, he says, next time, what does he say? In where? In heaven. Next time, next time in heaven. And the very last words of, of the traditional Seder are, are next year in Jerusalem. And a, as the final moment in the Seder uh, for the Jewish people, it, it's, an, it's emotionally significant and it finishes the Seder's journey because there's, there's a journey in the meal that you take from a reminder of the suffering of the past and, and for the Jewish people in the present to hopes for wholeness and freedom for the future. And the goal is, is to, the, the goal was for the Jewish people to take the, the Passover meal in, in Jerusalem as, as free people. But for us as believers, um, it will, the goal for us is it's going to be the new, the new heaven and the new earth. Our hope is for Christ's return when all things will be made new, will be made right again. So when, when Chad says next time in heaven, it's in anticipation of that day when all believers will celebrate at the banquet table in the presence of God Almighty. And Jesus points to this actual anticipation in verse 16 there in Luke 22 when he says, For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And I, I, I love this quote by John Piper in referring to verse 16. He says, I have been moved afresh by this picture of Jesus on the night before his death setting before himself the joy of his coming kingdom, telling his disciples that what he is signifying tonight in the meal and uh, accomplishing the next day on the cross will one day be fulfilled in the kingdom, a kingdom of people ransomed from every tongue, every tribe, all peoples, all nations. And then, but catch this, Jesus goes on and he adds, I'm not going to eat it until that day comes. You eat it to remember me and keep your hopes strong and empower yourselves for mission. But I'm going to wait until I can eat it new with you and with all the ransom that you will gather from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. So the Lord's Supper is not just a participation in, in remembrance of what Jesus did, but it's also a participation in 
anticipation of what is to come. And there in, in your outline, here's what I want you to write in anticipation. The Lord's Supper is a reminder of what is still to come. Jesus returned to complete and perfect our deliverance from brokenness and pain. Our deliverance from brokenness and pain. Hebrews 9, 28 says, So Christ, having been, having been offered once and once for all to bear as a burden the sins of many, will appear a second time when he returns to earth. Not to deal with sin, but to bring salvation to those who are eagerly and confidently waiting for him. Something that you hear us say in this church a lot is that we live in a, we live in a broken world. And I know we say it a lot, and so sometimes it can kind of lose its meaning. But when we say that, it means that there's a lot of things wrong in this world that we're living in. It's not, and the, the number one thing is, it's not what God intended. This world is broken. God intended perfection. God intended uh, for his world to work according to his will and to his plan, but the opposite is happening. And so our world is broken. Instead, we, what we have here in this world is, is we have fear, and we have sickness and death. We have pain. We have evil. We have depression. We have anxiety. We have fighting uh, amongst people, amongst nations. Um, we have marriages that are falling apart. We have families that are being torn apart. We have kids that are, that are being abused. There's people murdering. There's people lying. There's disobedience everywhere. People are making up their own truth. People are living in selfishness and on and on and on. And this is not the world that God created. But he's coming back to restore his creation. He's coming back to restore his creation and what rejoicing there will be when that happens. Um, it, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but in, in, in counseling world, in the solution focus, there's a solution focused theory of counseling. It, there's an intervention that's called the miracle question. And it goes something like this. Some, someone, uh, your, a therapist might ask this question. It says, suppose that tonight while you slept, a miracle happened. Um, and when you, when you awoke tomorrow, or when, when you uh, awake tomorrow, what would be some of the things that you would notice that would tell you that life had suddenly gotten better? And the whole idea behind that question is that the, the, the client, uh, the person coming to counseling, is challenged to look past their obstacles and hopelessness and focus on possibilities. Focus on, on what could be different. And this idea, what, it, what it's meant to do is to catapult the client from a, uh, just a problem-saturated context into a visionary context where he or she experiences some freedom to step out of the problem story and into the story where there is, where life becomes a little bit less full of problems and more problem free. And you see, the Lord's Supper is a reminder that there's more to come. Our miracle happened on the cross and, and in the resurrection. We don't have to be overcome by this life that's happening now, but we know that there's a future that's coming that will be greater than anything that we could ever think of or imagine. The Lord's Supper should, should catapult us from a problem-saturated context into a visionary context where we step out of the current current situation, we, we step out of the current broken situation that we're in into Jesus' story that will remind us that we are, we are going to be in a world, in a new reality where it is problem free, where it is as God intended. 2 Thessalonians 1.7 says, and God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels. Some of us need rest. Rest is coming. Relief is coming. It's so easy to be overcome by the troubles of this world. And I'm in no way, I don't in no way want to diminish the, those troubles. I know that in this room today there are individuals. I know that in this room today there are marriages, there are families who are going through, for a lack of a better term, they're, they're going through through hell right now. But the joy and hope for the believer is that all of that is temporary. 
It's not forever. This is not forever. There is no need to lose hope. There is no need to quit. There is no need to abandon God. He will be faithful now, and he will make all things new. I've asked Jeff to come up here and sing a song about that reality. Face to face with Christ my Savior Face to face, what will it be When with rapture I behold Him Jesus Christ who died for me Let's sing this chorus together Face to face I shall behold Him Far beyond the starry sky Face to face in all His glory I shall see Him by and by What rejoicing! What rejoicing in His presence When are gone all grief and pain When the crooked ways are straightened And the dark things shall be plain Face to face I shall behold Him Far beyond the starry sky Face to face in all His glory I shall see Him by and by We shall see Him by and by Revelation 21, 4 through 7. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am make, making everything new. And then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said it to me. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will enter, inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. That, my friends, is the hope that we have. That, my friends, is where we are headed. That, my friends, is the anticipation that we see in the Lord's Supper. That's what's coming. We're getting ready for Christ's return. And in the meantime, we remember that God is with us now. And so we are so thankful for what God did on the cross and his resurrection. Remembrance and anticipation.